Okay, let's get to God's Word in a second. But here's what I found. Scripture is not meant to be read quick. It's not meant to be rushed through. It is popular and maybe some of us do it here. It's popular to do the whole Bible in a year thing. And I kind of think it's cool to have a sweeping view of the Bible and know what it says. But there's something that Scripture is designed for. When we open this sacred text called Scripture, one of the things that we're supposed to do is we're supposed to take a slow, languid stroll through each chapter and verse. And what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to meditate on it deeply. The world is made up of two groups of people. The type of people that chew a mint when they get one, psychopaths. And the people who do what it's supposed to do, they slowly let it dissolve on the tongue. They let it coat all of their palate. You know, that's the civilised way you do it. Well, when it comes to the Bible, what you're supposed to do is not wolf it down like you're like a kid at school is weak. You know, you're, you're supposed to like just let it, let it sit in with you and in you sit in the text and let it dissolve on your tongue like a lozenger and let it, let it, let it find its way into your, 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 your cells and your pores and your lungs and your bloodstream. So often what happens is because we live in a world that bigger is better and more is important and all that sort of stuff, we rush through the Bible and then we find out that actually sometimes we don't quite know the deep meditation that a particular chunk of the Bible is asking us to bathe in. So I thought this morning that perhaps what we do is we would take a little chunk and we just meditate in one of the many possible ideas that you'd get from this text. And I've just found after 20 years of studying Scripture, every passage of Scripture is like a diamond. And every time you tilt it, you see a different facet of it. Every time you, 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 you turn it, it refracts the light of God in a different way. It is incredible. I can never exhaust this process of slowly and languidly meditating on Scripture. So I thought perhaps today we would meditate on a chunk together and then maybe just ask ourselves, what is the observation that this meditation seeks to help me grow my life through? You know, the truth is, if you read Genesis chapter 1 and 2, everything about creation and the creation narrative shows us that God has a plan for life and it could be summed up in this one word, flourishing that God wants life to flourish. He didn't create life to be mediocre. He didn't create life to just, you know, survive. He created life to thrive. And that's why Genesis 1 and 2 contain superlative language that goes over and above to help you understand. There's living creatures filling, filling the air, filling the sea, filling the trees, crawling and creeping all along the ground, a universe teeming with life, 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 a planet teeming with life. And then what does God do on that planet teeming with life? He puts two naked vegetarians in a garden and says, just make more people. And they're like, well, how do we do that? He's like, you'll work it out, don't worry. (laughs) Who would write a story like that but the God of the heavens, right? This is extravagant generosity to people who don't, they don't even have to worry about what they're wearing today because their birthday suit is all they need. And you know, as you get older, it needs an iron, but all they need is their birthday suit. And, 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 um, and they have the entire planet to enjoy together. Just make more people and spread the light of God all over it. That is an image of an utterly generous universe, a hospitable place. God gives them every, every seed bearing plant for food and it's good for food and it's beautiful to the eye. There's aesthetics and function. The engineers and the beauticians are happy, you know, generous. And so God begins the revelation of Scripture by showing us an utterly hospitable, generous universe where life is supposed to thrive, not just survive. And that's what we find in Genesis 1 and 2. But in Genesis chapter 3, we pause and we meditate. Now, who's heard the saying, familiarity breeds contempt? So we probably know Genesis chapter 3, if we've hung around Western culture or church culture for very long, we probably think we quite know Genesis chapter 3. And what I want to do is I just want to read a couple of bits of it this morning and for us to meditate on a big idea that barely anyone knows about uh, and say, how does this help my life thrive instead of survive? How does this take me towards God's chosen heart for people for a flourishing life of his peace and his love and his goodness and his kindness? So perhaps we would pray. Let's pray before we open the scriptures this morning. Father, we come from all sorts of journeys this week and all sorts of walks of life. And we followed stuff this week and stuff's followed us this week. And we've been broken and we've broken stuff. But Lord, all, every single one of us this morning, we pause and we open our hearts and our minds to you. And as we 
Turn to your word, we pray. God, would you shape us? God, where we need healing, would you heal us? God, where we need holes patched in our soul and in our psyche and our mind, our will and our emotions, would you patch them for us this morning? Come by your Holy Spirit and take your word and do us good, we pray. And shape us more like Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen and Amen. The third chapter of Genesis. Genesis chapter three, we're going to start reading from verse one through to verse 10. That's the third chapter of Genesis from verse one through to verse 10. I'm reading from the NIV. You can read from whatever you like the best. It says this, Now the serpent was more crafty. Everybody say crafty. The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, pause button. This chapter presupposes some background knowledge. This chapter presupposes that perhaps you have a little bit of idea about what God said in Genesis 2 about the tree. And if you had a little bit of an idea about what God said about the tree in Genesis chapter 2, when you're reading the serpent's discussion with Eve in Genesis chapter 3, you're supposed to go, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, that ain't what God said. And uh, perhaps one of the early meditations in Genesis chapter 3 for you and I is it's actually a brilliant idea to critique incoming thoughts questions and ideas against the lens of, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, what did God say? Because, you know, there's things being said in all sorts of ways in our life, isn't there? Marketing specialists used to say that you are a victim of 3,000 targeted digital messages every day wherever you go. So it's not a bad idea to go, well, when there's a world out there broadcasting an absolute avalanche and a tirade of information I should just double check what God said. And what we are about to see in a story is the story of the unfolding of events where somebody who uncritically accepts an incoming idea and forgets to measure it against what God said. Even worse, allows someone unknowing to tell them God says this, God thinks this, and they forget to go back to the source and just double check. I don't know, does God really think that? And... uh, just to make a bit of a plot spoiler for you, we make a bit of a dog's breakfast of stuff if we don't double check what God says about stuff. So the woman says, let's look in verse two. So the woman said to the serpent, nah, we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Bum, bum. Sorry, Eve, you kind of got it a bit right, but you got it a bit wrong. And when you get it a bit right and you get it a bit wrong, the bit that you get right shouldn't harm you, but the bit that you get wrong can really harm you. Yeah. And most of the time, lies come to us with just a little bit of truth enough. It's the, a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down, doesn't it? So she's a bit off track, not completely aware and faithful of what had wisely and previously been warned by God, whose intention is that life would flourish. And he warned Adam and Eve, if you do certain things, life won't flourish. That's going to take you down the pathway of death. You don't want to do that. And then she begins a conversation with a, well, it says a serpent in the text. The Hebrew word is the nachash. The nachash, I think that's a really great word to say in winter to clear the throat. And Akash is an interesting word because it can be a noun, a verb, and an adjective. And although it comes translated in our English Bibles as serpent, actually, if you were a person who lived in the ancient Near East, Babylon or Jerusalem or Israel or Egypt in the ancient world, 3000 BC, something like that, then when you saw the word Nachash, you would understand that the, the idea of a serpent is used more symbolically than literally. So, you know, as Christians, we don't really believe like that snakes used to walk around talking to everyone all the time and stuff like that. What we're being told is the story of an ancient spiritual being called a Nachash. As a noun, it's a fire serpent, which was a well-known image in all of the temples and and cave carvings and paintings of the ancient Near East. And then as a verb, uh, it's shiny, shining and bright one is the word. And then as an adjective, shininess is a thing too. So it's kind of like this mystical spiritual being, an ancient Near Eastern throne guardian, which they talked about all the time. It was a figure for both witchcraft and wisdom in the ancient world. So now we're understanding that what's happening in the story is that Eve is going about her daily business and the shining, bright, mystical throne guardian is coming to her and offering her some divination, some divine 
wisdom. And actually, the nachash in the ancient world is often used as a symbol of wisdom, much like today you might find people talking about wisdom and getting into spells and wizardry and all sorts of weird stuff as well. So Eve is supposed to know, hang on, I'm dealing with a being that's just being described to me as shrewd, shrewd. So I better be careful if he's shrewd. You know what I'm saying? You know shrewd? It's a cool word, isn't it? Who likes to walk in shrewdity? So, because you could say that a businessman, a businessman is too shrewd for my liking, I'm not going to do business with him. But also, if my daughter went and got a good deal on a car, I'd say, oh, she's savvy, that one, she's a shrewd shopper. So it's sort of like, I, I can use it positively or negatively, therefore, the context of the story, I've got to watch this space, I've got to watch what's going on, the content of the story, the context of the story, to work out, is shrewd a good thing or a bad thing? And that's what you see the Hebrew word means. The Hebrew word can mean like wise, or it can mean wicked. It, it can mean cunning, and cunning can be good, or, or cunning can be bad. And so therefore, when this word shrewd is used at the start of the story, you and I wear being asked to think about something, to meditate on something. Okay, it's more shrewd than any other animal. Mm, I better watch out. I better watch this space and work out what type of wisdom is the nachash going to bring to me? Is it going to bring to me something wise or is it going to bring to me something wicked? That's what an intelligent person would think of if they saw a nachash bearing shrewdity coming in their direction. God says... You mustn't eat from it, don't touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Not the purpose of today's message, but if Genesis 1 tells me they're made in God's image, um, aren't they already like God? It's so interesting to me that like, Pseudo-wisdom often comes along offering you something you already have access to in God. You'd be much happier if you did this, but blessed are the peacemakers. You'd, you'd be filled with joy if you did this, but the fruit of the Spirit is joy. There's, sometimes we actually already have things in God, but pseudo wisdom is going to come along and entice us. You know, life could be better for you. And I think that's at the heart of the meditation in Genesis 3 is, is sometimes I'm going to mistake shrewdity for wise when it's truly wicked. And other times I'm going to be offered wisdom and I'm going to go, oh, that's wicked. But it could be wise. How many people know not every good idea tastes good, does it? <laughs> you won't surely die. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, listen to this, and pleasing to the eye. Now watch what happens. We've already been told that God looked at every other tree and said it's good for food and pleasing to the eye. And so he gave it to them as a good gift for their nourishment. Have it all, baby. Right. But now this pseudo wisdom comes along and makes Eve an offer. I'm going to sell you something you already have. I'm going to change a little bit of God's known revelation. And you think your life's going to flourish more because I am shrewd. And your eyes are going to be open. I'm promising you all this stuff. Some of the stuff I'm promising you, you're already having God, but now I'm accentuating it a certain way to make God out to be an ogre spoiler sport. And I want to entice you a different way. And now, the same way God looks at the good stuff He gave you, you're now looking at stuff that shrewdity wants to give you. God saw every tree is good for food, pleasing to the eye. Here you go. Now Eve is starting to replace God instead of reflect God. She's beginning to become an image maker instead of an image bearer. Yeah. She saw it's good to the eye and pleasing for food. And listen to this bit. She saw it's good, it, it, it's good for food and it's pleasing to the eye. Look at this. And also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and she ate it. Also Desirable for gaining wisdom. Wisdom. Well, shrewdity in Genesis 3.1 can be interpreted as wise and wisdom or it can be interpreted as wickedness and evil. And it's kind of in the eye of the beholder in Scripture because the word for shrewd can be used positively or negatively. So watch what's happened. Eve has run into a shrewd character. The shrewd character has broadcast an idea which she doesn't fact check. Let me check what God, the author of life, thinks about this. 
And as she begins to have a conversation with the Nachash, she drifts further away from a dependency on God. He's my source of wisdom. Someone said to me once, well, why doesn't God want them to know the difference between good and evil? Don't we teach our children that? Well, that here's the thing. For me to pluck of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what I'm saying is I want good and evil's definitions and locus to be inside myself. I want to decide good and evil for myself. If I don't eat of that tree, I don't know the difference between good and evil. So what have I got to do? I've got to go to God, the creator of the universe and go, God, I live in your world. You're the one that separates day and night and salt and fresh water and, 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 and the land from the sea. And so basically you're the one that establishes boundaries in the universe. You're the one that knows how life will thrive. So if I wanna know what is truly good and what is truly evil, I've gotta to come to you because you're the source of all that important knowledge. So the essence of the temptation from the Nahash with Eve is to sow an idea into her heart without explicitly telling her about the very dire consequences of it. Eve, you could be like God. In fact, God doesn't want you to eat that tree because He knows you'll be like Him. Your eyes will be open. You'll be enlightened. You'll be shrewd. You'll be wise. And good and evil's knowledge will live inside you and you won't need God anymore. In fact, God won't be able to tell you what to do. You can decide for yourself what's dark and light and day and night. You you can do you, boo. You can have your own choice. What's good for you can be good for you. What's good for you can be good for you. That's my truth. I'm gonna speak out. You have your truth. That's the sale that the Nakash has made. Imagine doing life where you're God. Imagine life replacing God instead of humbly reflecting God. Imagine being an image maker instead of an image bearer. That's the sale of the Nachash. I'm selling you something. She ate it. She took it and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her funny story. Adam's just like accompanying her. So he's as culpable in the sin as Eve. He goes along. I was talking to this about with some men recently. One of them said, hey, just go easy on Adam, mate. He did get offered food by a naked woman. Who could say no to that? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't tried it. He was with her and he ate it. Then listen to this. Then the eyes of both of them were open. Well, hey, 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 hey. That's just what the serpent promised. He is shrewd. He is wise. He might even be a truth teller. If you eat of the fruit, God doesn't want you to eat it. He knows your eyes will be open. She eats it and her eyes are open. Can you believe God was standing in the way between Adam and Eve and true enlightenment? Their eyes were opened. Wow. And then they realised they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. That just sounds itchy. Think, think about this. They, they, they sewed clothing for themselves. They sewed clothes. They, they, before they live in God's world, a flourishing world teeming with life, reflecting God, image bearers, face-to-face relationship with the creator of the universe. Now their eyes are open and what do they do? Go, wow, I'm so much more wiser now. I'm so shrewd. That is not what the opening of their eyes yielded. They did not get shrewd. What they got was nude. The title of today's message is shrewd or nude. That's actually the choice we're faced with a lot of the time, shrewd or nude. Am am, am I going to become more wise through what I am tempted to? Am I going to become more wise through the idea that I uncritically accept a broadcast from? Or is this going to ultimately lead me naked and exposed? I I, I could end up ashamed. I I could end up vulnerable. I I could end up having to run away and hide. Now listen to how this eye-opening experience fractures Adam and Eve's relationship. There has never been a thing called clothing before. There's never been a thing called sewing before. And yet so sophisticated is the shame game that Adam and Eve know I can no longer expose myself to God or myself to you. But in fact, what I have to do is I have to run away and hide. And Eve goes that way and Adam goes that way. And what they make for themselves is clothing. Clothing from fig leaves. Clothing, that word will be used in the rest of the Hebrew Bible for armour. 
Vulnerability, you've probably heard Brene Brown talk about it. Can't have a good relationship, can't have a flourishing life without the capacity to be vulnerable. The Latin word, vulnerabilis, is where we get our word vulnerability from. It means the soldier on the battlefield without armour, the capacity to be seen, the capacity to be wounded. A naked self. That's how you have intimate relationships. Well, Adam and Eve can't have that anymore. They are now forced. They cannot bear to see and be seeing. They cannot even bear to look at each other's nakedness, to see each other for who they truly are. Now you've got to conceal and cover and hide because you got the wisdom the Nakash offered you. You thought you get shrewd, but you ended up nude. You're naked and exposed. And when you're naked and exposed, the only next thing is to run and hide. They went and make fig leaf coverings for themselves. Listen, and then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord called to the man and said, where are you? In the Hebrew, the word for where is the lament, like in the book of Lamentations. God, where are you? And it's like God is walking through the garden lamenting, Adam, where are you? It's like not like God lost them, right? Like you don't imagine this story. God, they're going, damn, I only had two of them. Where have they gone? (laughs) Adam, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Shrewd, wise, cunning or wicked. Will my course in life make me shrewd or will it make me nude? Anyone here like Scrabble? Are you doing all right? We'll take a breath, hey? Okay, anyone like Scrabble? Who likes Scrabble? I'm hopeless at Scrabble. My wife is brilliant at Scrabble. I thought I'd beat it because I'm kind of good with words and languages, but I suck at Scrabble. Well, in Scrabble, if you could make the word paranomasia, paranomasia, you would score 15 points. Is that good in Scrabble? Who, who, who can't? Who, who, who could use another? It's, it's okay. Uh, Annie Sue's turning up her nose. She's got, she's got better words than that. Zoological will get you one. Uh, so it was xylophone. So listen to this, paranomasia. Now, paranomasia is a thing that is all the way through the text of Scripture. Paranomasia is a literary device. When you study ancient languages, paranomasia is what you look for because it is a little signal in a text. Hey, pause and think a lot about this. You're seeing paranomasia. Everybody say paranomasia. Congratulations, just graduated Bible college. Go get a PhD at the cafe after the service. That's fine. Now, the closest thing we would have in our culture to paranomasia, which we do have, would be this other thing called dad jokes. You know what dads are like. Chuck that slide up there. Who doesn't love a good pair of New Balance sneakers and some overpriced cargo pants? You know, let me give you an example. Dad jokes. Dad jokes are an example of paranomasia because they're funny, right? It's like, Dad, I'm hungry. Hi, hungry, I'm Dad. And you see, there's a word play on that genius, genius, very sophisticated humour. There's a word play on it because when the child says, I'm hungry, the child is using hungry as an adjective, but the dad thinks the child's using it as a noun. I'm introducing myself. I am hungry. Hello, hungry. I am dad. I mean, that's just genius, isn't it? All the dads put that one in your kit bag, okay? Oh, what about this one? What about this one? Why did the scarecrow win an award? Because he was outstanding in his field. You know, I, these country folk are slow up here in, in Toowoomba. They don't get the sophisticated thing. You know, my friend recently, you need to pray for him, he fell into an upholstery machine. It's okay. He's fully recovered. <laughs> Word plays, puns, double meaning dad jokes, right? What they are is they are an example of paranomasia. And what it is, paranomasia is when a word looks the same, or is the same and has two meanings or two intendances, <laughs> or when a word sounds similar like a rhyme, for example, okay? Any of those things. So there's a homograph, the word looks the same, okay? Lead and lead. I was led to my death by drinking lead, okay? Same spelling, same word, two different things. That's called a homograph. They, they look the same, but they mean something different. There's a homophone. They, they, they sound the same. They sound the same. There, there, and there. Whenever you're hugging an OCD person, you pat me like, oh, there, there, there but in your head you say it the three different ways, you know, to mess with their, mess with their mind, okay? That's a homophone. It's, it's, it sounds the same, but actually it's spelt three different ways, okay? Homograph, homophone. And there's all sorts of, um, of paranomasia that you find in every language. In Genesis chapter one, two, and three, man, those texts are loaded with paranomasia. Word plays and puns on word and, and multiple layered meanings of word. And it's quite fascinating. Now, whenever you see paranomasia, what you're supposed to do, instead of 
supposed to speed over it. You're supposed to slow down and you're supposed to say, hang on, what am I being told? What am I being taught? What am I really learning here? Okay, now I'm gonna show you the Hebrew word for shrewd. Let's have a look at that up on the screen. This is the Hebrew word arum, arum. And it means shrewd, shrewd, wise, could be wicked. Hebrew word arum. Now I know that maybe perhaps you have actually got a life and friends, so you might not be able to read Hebrew, but if you have a look at the symbols, in Hebrew you read Hebrew from the right to the left, okay? And so you can sort of make use of this, this letter here. This is the ayin. It's like a funny looking backwards Y thing. Then you've got this other like half a staircase thing there. That's the letter resh. There's a couple of vowels. Then you've got this weird um, dented square that looks like someone bumped into you at the shopping centre, you know, and that's a mem. Uh, ayin a resh and a mem, an A, a R and a M, formulate the basis of the word shrewd, arum, arum. In the story, the serpent, the nachash comes to Eve and he is more shrewd than everything. And as he gets, begins to have a conversation with her, she starts to develop a craving. Well, I wouldn't mind a bit of shrewdity. And she starts to develop the thing. She looks at the tree he's offering her and it is desirable for gaining wisdom. She's talking to a shrewd being and she wouldn't mind being a little more shrewd herself. I, you know what? I want what you got. I'll have what she's having. And so here's the funny thing. She eats what is promised, but she doesn't end up as shrewd. She ends up as nude. I'm gonna put the Hebrew word for nude up on the screen. This is the Hebrew word erom, erom. And what you'll notice, this is the genius thing of para- I told you I could put you to sleep, right? All the insomniacs are very grateful to this right now. Arom, you'll, you'll see it's got the, it's got the ayin, the Y looking thing. It's got the staircase looking thing. And it's got the dented square looking thing, okay? The, the, the ayin, the resh and the mem. That is called paranomasia. Because to the Hebrew world, especially when you scroll it handwritten, those words are very difficult to tell apart. And with an ancient Hebrew pronunciation, they are almost said the same way. Aram, 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 yeah, yeah, aram, aram. And that's where this story makes you stop and pause. Because shrewd and nude look very similar. It's kind of sometimes hard to tell the difference. It's sometimes dangerous that you think you're getting one thing and you get another thing. I, my entire life, have had to be careful about my choices and actions and behaviours because so many times what I thought was shrewd left me exposed. Let's take my addictions, for example. I I began to drink as a 10 year old because I was staying awake at night with crippling anxiety attacks, scared to hear footsteps coming down the hall. And long after those footsteps stopped coming down the hall, I was still scared well into my 20s that they were coming down the hall. And the only way I could not be scared about that was to drink myself to sleep. I mean, it seems like a good idea, doesn't it? It's like, well, that, what a pragmatic individual, what a smart guy. You developed a way of solving your problem and you didn't even need a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a counsellor. Go you, what a legend. Shrewd. Sold an idea, did that with weed, did it with cocaine, did it with drinking and partying and sex and thought I could find comfort in the arms of weird strangers I'd meet at music festivals. And wow, Ben, what a smart guy, eh? Look at you solving all your problems. What I couldn't have known was this thing called opponent process theory. Yeah, sounds shrewd. Opponent process theory is this. What goes up must come down. The number one reason why any type of addiction, whether it's pornography, shopping, shoes, eyelashes, booze, drugs, puppies, Instagram, cat videos, TikTok likes, people pleasing, food, wine, whatever you want. The number one reason why all addictions will ultimately ruin your life is because of opponent process theory. Because what comes up, what goes up must come down. That's why you know that if you've ever tried to drink yourself happy, you know there's this other thing called being hung over. And when I wake up tomorrow after I drunk myself happy, I ain't happy at all. 
And when I snort myself happy, I'm gonna crash hard. And then because I crash hard, I don't go back to neutral. I was at neutral before. I don't go back to neutral because with opponent process theory, the higher you go, your brain, your endocrine system, your hormones, your central nervous system will say, well, you've taken yourself up so high, we've got to take you to the exact mirror image low. So do you know that every time you smoke yourself happy, you're actually smoking yourself sad? Every time you drink yourself happy, you're drinking yourself sad. And this is what you do. You come up with a wise strategy. Well, then I'll just drink some more when I feel sad. I'll just smoke some more. I won't let myself go down. I'll just keep doing it. And that's why all addictions are subject to the law of diminishing returns. That you always need more and more and more and more and more and more and more of any particular substance or stimulus to bring you back to an even keel. So if you play with addictive behaviours enough, and that can be the internet, Instagram, Facebook, pornography, drugs, alcohol, puppies, whatever. The more you do it, the more your brain says, hang on, you're gaming the system. You keep taking yourself up. We're gonna bring you down to the exact mirror mirror image opposite negative. And then you have more to try to buoy yourself up, but then you're fighting against your own central nervous system, which is trying to level you out and come up with an average stability. And your brain eventually says, you're gaming the system. So then you get this condition called anhedonia. Anhedonia is the inability to feel pleasure. And your brain starts to take all the bits of your brain that produce dopamine and feel good chemicals. And you know what it does? It kills off some of those bits. It kills off some of those brain cells. It's called dopamine pruning. It kills off those brain cells to the point where now you barely have any dopamine in your system, which means you are incapable of feeling pleasure. And that's different from a standard variety clinical depression or depression because this one takes a long, long time to recover from, usually three to five years if you do everything well. Because your brain says what goes up must come down and you're trying to take it up so high that the only way we can teach you not to do this is remove all possibility for feeling pleasure. And that's where Ben Teefee was when he was in his 20s, the inability to feel pleasure. I was talking to a guy the other day and addictions weren't his thing. He's just moved into his million dollar house, beautiful house. And him and his wife have spent the last 20 years chasing, 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 dollar, 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 career, 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 promotion, promotion, promotion. And he's showing me his new house and we went and sat in his study, in his study, study. And he cried his eyes out about his three children and their own addictions and their behavioural disorders and their depression and their their inability for the parents to connect with them anymore. See, I was sold, it's shrewd if you get addicted, but you know what he was sold? He was sold, it's shrewd if you're a rampant materialist. And I was left naked and exposed through my addictions, but you know, now this guy, his family has been left naked and exposed. And all, he didn't realise when his kids were young, all those years of never mum and dad being home and mum and dad believing the lie, well, if we're providing financially, we're doing well. And instead, he's got three children that have had no attachment, no role modelling, no severe, no serious relationship with their parents. And now on the cusp of young adulthood, they are showing the severe and dire emotional and psychological consequences of a lack of attachment. I'll tell you something, they have a great house. They do not have a good home. Some of us, we've been sold the lie get more stuff, get more stuff, get work harder, get more things, have more toys, have, get more money. And, and that could be at the expense of some of our relationships. It seems shrewd family, but you know, it leaves you naked and exposed at the end of the day. What if we pause this morning before we move on with our day and we reflect on the paranormalia of the text of Genesis 3 and we ask ourselves what this deep meditation calls and causes us to reflect on. God, am I buying a lie that's shrewd that I should be careful doesn't leave me nude? Am I, am, am, am I being sold something I can have in you, but it's a pseudo thing that's gonna take me down a path of destruction? You know, I think all over this room and me included, every single one of us, we've got to be careful because in today's world, we are susceptible to a barrage of messages which could just be a shiny creature, a bright, shiny, sparkly thing selling us shrewdity. We're going to eat it 
And eventually, our eyes will be open and we'll realise we're nude, man. How many times if you reflect in your life, now that you're wiser, could you say, I didn't realise at the time I was making a big mistake. I didn't realise at the time I wasn't, I, you know, you know the, the Princess Pride? I do not think you, this means what you think it means. I don't think I'm going to get, I, I, I didn't get what I was chasing. Many of us. In Australian culture, there's a new thing, try before you buy. Don't get married, just live together for a while. Shrewd. Hey, that sounds like a savvy consumer, doesn't it? But those people have double the divorce rate of people who don't try before they buy. Here's another lie. Man, get out of that marriage. What do you want to be married to him for? Run away and find someone else. And then you run away and find someone else. And then, you know, everywhere you go, there you are. So that marriage is just as miserable as that one. In fact, by the social stats and the research, unless you're very careful, it's doubly as miserable as that one. And they've got a double divorce rate than those people. Shrewd. Get a new one. Could just leave you nude, couldn't it? By the way, if you are in your second marriage, you shouldn't feel condemnation about that. Here's my advice. Just do a really good job on this one. Put God at the centre and honour Him and honour each other. There's all sorts of ways our culture is selling us shrewdity. It gives us nudity. Shall we close in prayer this morning before I hand back to Pastor Chris? I wonder if you could just bow your heads and close your eyes. What, what I'd love you to do is just say, hey, God, hey, let's, let's all over this room put up our spiritual antenna. God, show me, open my eyes. Don't let pain, don't let the fig leaf be the thing that opens my eyes. God, open my eyes now as I look to You. Show me. Maybe some of us as I've spoken, God has hovered over our hearts and minds gone, yeah, yeah, you're just a little bit exposed there. My son, my daughter. God in His grace is saying, come on child, you, 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 you thought it was shrewd, it's gonna leave you nude. Now's the time to do a U-turn. Now's the time to get off the exit ramp from that direction. Maybe someone seems to say, hey God, will you show me? Will you warn me? Will you open my heart? Here's the thing, I think some of us know there's been a little voice in the back of our heads for a period of time telling us, hey mate, maybe don't go that way. Don't go that way. And because God is gentle and loving and definitely not a tyrant or a bully, He'll, He'll let us make our choices and just coax and, and, and draw. But sometimes we just know that we know that we know we're gonna do our own thing. And my prayer for you today, my sister, my brother, is in Jesus' Name that your heart would be open to a deep meditation from a loving God who wants that your life would flourish. My prayer for you is that you would be somebody who develops and blows air and oxygen on the coals of the ability to criticise ideas and don't believe everything you think and say, <laughs> but actually check, what, what does God say about that? I pray where you feel vulnerable that you take that to your Father in heaven who loves you and has your best interests at heart. I pray you don't go away and hide in the trees. Pray that you live an open life. Pray that you pursue what is wise, not what's shrewd. And I pray, you don't end up nude in Jesus' name. Amen.